all right good afternoon everyone um, the first mention i must make for this uh, panel discussion that we're having today is mr jairaman the uh, quite quite renowned journalist who had planted the seed for this idea and has now this has now come to fruition uh, we we have today a very interesting panel discussion uh, on perspectives on the cap on capital punishment or in the observation of the 75th anniversary of uh, Mahatma Gandhi's assassination. Uh, we have three panelists and a moderator. Uh, the, the, the panelist, Professor Narendra Pani, is a faculty here at NIAS. He is the Dean of the School of Social Sciences and the head of the uh, Inequality and Human Development Program. Professor Pani is an economist by training who has taken a multidisciplinary approach to Indian political economy and he has relied on methods derived from the writings of M.K. Gandhi. And over the last three and a half decades, he has uh, held positions in academia and the media. He has had several books to his credit. He was also a member of the task force on manufacturing set up by the government of Karnataka in 2013. He was also a member of the working group set up by the planning commission to review the performance of the M MG and uh, NREGA, and also a member of the Board of Governors of the Institute of Social and Economic Change. Uh, the moderator, Professor Sarasuth Mr. Thomas, is uh, from the National Law School of India. Uh, he, she was the former registrar of the law school, and over the span of 25 years, she has taught uh, at the law school. She has built up the Human Rights Lawyering Project and the Center for Women and the Law. Professor Sarasuth's areas of teaching are human rights, gender and family law, and she has been awarded several fellowships, including the Linnaeus Palm, the British Council, and the Wiscom Fellowships. Uh, she is no, uh, she, she, she's uh, quite familiar with Nia, so these are quite familiar grounds for her. Um, Dr. Aparna Chandra teaches, uh, researches and writes on constitutional law, on human rights, on gender and the law, and on judicial process reform. Her current research focuses on rights, adjudication by courts, gender and the law and empirical legal studies. And in collaboration with the Center for Reproductive Rights in New York, she, undertook, she has undertaken a study on legal barriers to accessing safe abortion services in India. She is also part of the European Research Council funded project by the Israel Democracy, Democracy Institute on fundamental rights adjudication and in various jurisdictions around the world. And is, she is also the national co-convener of the Indian Feminist Judgments Project. She is faculty at the law school, who we also have here. Yeah. Our last panelist is Ms. Preeti Das, who has graduated from the law school, National Law School, Orisha, in 2014, where she was also a recipient of the gold medal for securing the first rank. She has completed her LLM from Harvard Law School in 2019 on a Fulbright Fellowship. And prior to joining the law school in just October, I think, uh, she has worked uh, with, with the, the National Law University, Delhi, where she undertook empirical research on capital sentencing in India. Uh, Preeti has also worked as a summer academic fellow at Harvard Law School, and at NLS, she hopes to use empirical research to influence, influence pedagogy. Um, so we have uh, all four panelists here, and to open the event, may I uh, request our uh, director, Professor Shailesh Naik. Thank you, Vanant. And uh, first of all, I would like to welcome our guest, uh, Professor Sarasu, Professor Preeti, and Professor Parna, and of course, uh, my colleague, Professor Pani. And I would like to join Vanant in thanking Professor Jairam to initiate uh, this. Uh, so thank you very much. <coughs> and this uh, topic, you know, this on the capital punishment, I think, there are several views on this and the dialogue is going on for quite some time. But today I think uh, it's very important on the significance of today when uh, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated. And uh, he probably believed that there should not be any that punished. So I think uh, this topic, I think we have to also view from uh, Today's uh, conditions, a uh, variety of things, there is a one very strong view on the capital punishments, uh, Nirbhaya and all had taken 
absolutely a dialogue on absolutely at the other end. So I think we have extremely good uh, panelists who had a lot of experience, not only the law side, but also on the human side. And I'm sure that uh, we all will get uh, better insight into this topic. And thank you very much, all of you, for coming and joining with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anant, and everyone else who has, uh, you know, been behind the scenes organizing this. Uh, I'm personally really happy to return to NIAS. I came, I think, last in March uh, to do a session on gender. Um, uh, well, uh, we have some time for discussion, and what we have planned to do is to uh, have all the speakers speak for about eight to ten minutes. And then we will have a discussion among uh, the four of us, and then we will later open it out to the audience. So if you have any questions, I would request you to uh, note it down, and you'll get ample time, I think, to ask those questions. Um, this is a collaboration between NIAS and the National Law School. Um, you are in NIAS now, but I'd also like to uh, share with you that the National Law School has worked on this area for uh, a long time. Uh, from different dimensions, from a human rights uh, perspective, from a constitutional perspective, from a criminal law perspective. And I'm glad that today we have a very diverse uh, panel. Um, uh, we have Professor Pani who will take us through a lot of the background uh, with an analysis to how things have moved until uh, today. And uh, though the three of us are from uh, the same institution, we bring in very different uh, perspectives. Uh, Aparna will be uh, talking um, from a constitutional perspective, and Preeti will be focusing largely on a criminal law perspective, um, and she brings with us her rich experience on, uh, you know, cases on the ground when she worked worked uh, at NLUD on the project. Um, so welcome uh, everyone, and uh, thank you, Nias, for uh, this opportunity for taking the initiative and in, uh, in setting forward this panel. And let me first of all request Professor Pani to begin. Thank you, Professor Sarasu Thomas. Uh, when we consider uh, the issue of capital punishment on the 75th anniversary of, of Gandhi's assassination, it, it offers a chance to look at uh, two views of capital, two aspects of capital punishment. One is the formal aspect, what I would call the formal aspect, the legal process. But there's another aspect that's becoming increasingly important in India, and that is what you can consider the informal aspect, and which is now seen in the view that is expressed quite freely, that uh, sees Godse's action almost as if it's a capital punishment for perceived injustices that Gandhi was supposed to have done. Now, these two processes are treated separately uh, in the discussion and in, in much of the uh, literature on this. But in practice, I would like to use the next 10 minutes to argue that in practice, they have been actually closely interlinked and one has fed into the other. Uh, we could start with the idea of the capital punishment within the judiciary, which had enough safeguards uh, built into it. There was to be no doubt about guilt. There was to be, uh, the crime was expected to be heinous so that you only uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, gave capital punishment at times when you were, uh, when, in the rarest of rare cases, I think is the terminology that is used. Right? So there were safeguards sup supposed to be built into it. And then it was, if the system worked very well and if the judiciary was isolated from social pressures, it was supposed to, uh, to, see, to be a, a, a sort of bearer of justice and uh, should be seen as that as not just carrying out justice, but seen as, as ca to be carrying out justice. Whether the, it has been actually carried out justice, I'll leave to my uh, distinguished uh, ex judicial uh, legal experts on this panel. But in terms of what is done, in terms of the justice that has been done or seen to be done, uh, there were definitely differing perceptions. To begin with, differing perceptions of justice between law and the people. There were caste, there was nepotism, 
on the ground. If you, even today you go to a village and if you say that you have not taken care of your family, they look down upon you rather than uh, respect you. Uh, if, similarly, if you're not loyal to your caste, that also has certain uh, a certain price to pay. This was the conditions on the ground. And you had a legal system that obviously dismissed all, all this. So there was that gap. The initial thinking was that you could bridge this gap through use of a jury system. You get objective people where they come in and then allow them to sit there. But that uh, it was soon clear that w that wouldn't work, most prominently in the 1959 Nanavati case, where you had this, uh, uh, this uh, dashing naval officer going up, picking up a gun from his uh, official store, going down, shooting down his wife's lover. And at that time, there was a massive identification of the press, etc., with the officer, so much so that the de jury declared him not guilty. So he, the case was, of course, taken back and put for a branch trial, and, and elements happened, and, and sort of was the precursor to the removal of the judici judiciary system itself, a jury system itself. But the fact is that essentially you were in a situation which was the first evidence that the social pressures that exist would influence the course of justice. That the isolation that you're trying to create for uh, uh, decisions even on a case like murder was not going to, going to actually happen. It did not help that the judiciary also has gone into extended delays. And as you go into extended delays, you develop a general impatience, particularly on issues uh, relating to extreme violence, including justice. And it was not long before political mobilization of that impatience took place. In some cases, it was, uh, it was formal, as in the case of the Naxalite movement, where they advocated killing as a part of their political strategy. But very often, it, was, it became largely, largely informal. But the strengthening of the belief that the fact that your judiciary was taking a view that there is nothing wrong in taking a life as punishment began to get sort of disseminated into a much larger view where, it, uh, where in every case anyone could decide that something, some injustice had been done to them and they could take a life as a part of it, particularly at a time when the judiciary did not seem to be working on time and, or seemed to be prone to extended delays. This is the extent of, to which this is widespread can best be seen in the response to killings and mass riots. After virtually every major mass riot, whether we're talking about, uh, about Gujarat, you're talking about the Sikh massacre in Delhi, or you're talking about the Nelly massacre during the Assam agitation, after every major uh, killing based on mass riots, the, person, the party associated with that killing has won an election. As, as won the election almost immediately after. So that is a kind of almost a consensus that it is actually all right to kill if, uh, if you perceive uh, an injustice. <clears throat> now, this, over time, as this has got consolidated, the state has also begun to align with the idea that it's all right to have this, uh, if the judiciary is not in a position to give you a, a, a death sentence, you can go ahead and enforce it yourself. And, this, uh, and as a response to that, the state has begun to take the same view. So you have encounter killings now, you have bulldozer justice, where the idea of waiting for a legal system seems to be totally, uh, uh, totally old-fashioned or in some sense inadequate. So you have a situation today where essentially uh, you have mass killings and justified hindered basis. This has gone on at, uh, to actually influence the judiciary itself because you now have the judiciary re reacting to these cases. I won't go into it in detail other than to point out that you had, for instance, the Nirbhaya case when there was a mass movement for, uh, against the criminals. You went had a hanging when it was the other way around. And in the Bilkis Banu case, you not, not only released them, you even celebrated them. So the entire system begins to, right? and this was something which we might say is something unusual or part of the Indian decline of the Indian, uh, Indian system, but it is something that, uh, that Gandhi foresaw. He saw this coming because he believed that there was no absolute truth which would mean that you can identify something without guilt. He saw this coming because he believed essentially 
that uh, th that there will be limits to the subjectivity of the use against the jury system, and he believed that the subjectivity of judges also will have its limits. So for him, you did not have a right to take a life, right? Simply because you did not have the absolute truth to actually go ahead and do it. I can. I think I'll stop here. Um, uh, thank you for that, and I think also for highlighting how important it is today as uh, we remember uh, Gandhi and the, you know, the fact that you know the Karachi Resolution in 1931. One of the things that stood out very starkly was our stand when uh, looking at the execution uh, of uh, Bhagat Singh and his comrades to say that you know this is not done and the death penalty should not be there. And to how quick you know it was turned around when it came to uh, Gandhi's own assassination, and I think you know um, a lot of uh, points that you know we hear in many places. I am uh, glad that you put together like the contrast between uh, Nirbhaya and Bilkis Bano, and why is there a difference in these two cases? Why is the uh, public so different? And I think also to uh, bring our focus to rights that might be violated even outside the death penalty where life might be taken away like in encounter killings where you don't have to go through the judicial rigmarole as they would see it uh, to uh, a quicker you know a solution so to speak uh, which takes away the very fundamental rights that our constitution seeks to protect so on that note let me now uh, move towards the constitution and hand this over to aparna um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Pani, for those remarks, because I think what I'm going to be talking about is how these informal social norms uh, start impacting the judiciary, right? So where you left off, I'll, I'll take off from where you left off. And to do that, I'm going to start with two stories. So first is the story of Dhananjay Chatterjee that many of you will be familiar with. But for those of you who don't remember, Dhananjay Chatterjee was a security guard. And he was accused of uh, the rape and murder of an 18-year-old woman who used to stay in the building where he was a uh, security guard. And um, he was given the death penalty. The judges felt that this was an egregious breach of trust, that the person that he was supposed to guard is the person that he violated um, and took the life of. Uh, and so they said in their judgment that society's cry for justice demands that the death penalty be, uh, be imposed upon uh, Dhananjay Chatterjee. Now, since 1997, there had been no uh, execution. But such was the outrage that in 2004, the uh, government decided to carry out the execution, and Thananjay Chatterjee was executed in, in 2004. Now, we come to Ramesh Bhai Rathor. Now, Ramesh Bhai Rathor has nearly identical facts. He is also a security guard. He is also um, accused of uh, killing someone who he was supposed to guard. The only difference was that this was the rape and murder of a child uh, who he was supposed to be um, guarding. The case comes before two judges of the Supreme Court, and they can't really agree on uh, whether he should be given the death sentence or not. One thought that Dhananjay Chatterjee's case squarely applied. It was exactly the same facts. If anything, this was worse because it was a defenseless child. The other thought that society's cry for justice is not the appropriate standard to look at to determine whether the death penalty should be given or not. We should be looking at whether Ramesh Bhai Rathor um, was a continuing threat to society. So anyway, they couldn't resolve this difference. It goes up before a three-judge bench. The three-judge bench says that, you know, we think that he's capable of reform. We don't think that he is a threat to society. We think that he can be reformed. Why? Because he's only 28 years old. Right? He, is, that he has a long life ahead of him. There's, ca there's capacity to reform. Uh, so I don't, so they, they decide that they, don't, they shouldn't impose the death penalty. This is not an appropriate case. Uh, and his age was a major factor. Right? Dhananja Chatterjee was 27 years old when he was executed. So Amesh Bhai Rathor was 28. Dhananja Chatterjee was 27. An identical facts. One is executed. Uh, overturning an informal moratorium of sorts, and, um, and Ramesh Bhai Rathor is, uh, is not. The second story I want to tell you is about um, Jita Singh, Kashmira Singh, and Harban Singh. The three of them are, were accused of having murdered a family of four somewhere in UP. The Allahabad High Court imposes the death penalty on all of them, and it finds that all of them were equally involved in the crime. Right? They, they had conspired together, they had participated in the crime, they were all equally guilty. Now, all of them appeal to the 
Supreme Court separately. They all have their own lawyers. Jita Singh's case comes up before a bench. The court refuses to even admit the appeal and says the, uh, you know, that ref uh, on the face of it, it says there's, no, there's nothing wrong here. Go ahead and carry out the execution. Jita Singh is executed. Uh, Kashmira Singh goes through a different lawyer to a different bench. That bench uh, admits his appeal, looks at his appeal and says, we don't think this is a case where the death sentence should be carried out and commutes it to a life imprisonment. Harban Singh had applied at the same time as Jita Singh, the, the person who was executed, had applied at the same time, but he had a different lawyer. Now, this lawyer, like his case was also uh, rejected. But this lawyer said, let me try once more and let me get the decision reviewed. So he files for a review. So his case is uh, you know, uh, detached from Jita Singh. Jita Singh is executed. Harban Singh is waiting for his new case to be heard. There's some delay, it's getting filed. When Kashmira Singh's judgment comes down. So then he goes to court and says, see, there's this other person who was equally responsible and he's been given the life Im uh, imprisonment. So I should be given the life imprisonment as well. And the court, of course, agrees. This is just to say, well, the reason I'm telling you these stories is that these stories point out much of what is wrong with the administration of the death penalty in um, contexts like uh, India. Uh, Preeti will be talking about the problems with the criminal justice system, but I want to focus on how we think about which are the cases that deserve death within the legal system and the problems um, with that. Um, if, if you recall, in Dhananja Chatterjee's case, a very important consideration for the court was society's cry for justice. What is society's cry for justice, really? Um, and where does that come from? Uh, Sarsu mentioned that in 1931, at the Karachi Resolution, um, the resolution uh, and Karachi Resolution goes on to become the blueprint for the fundamental rights uh, that we have in the Constitution. Um, they decided to abolish the death penalty because the Karachi Resolution comes a few weeks after Bhagat Singh Sukhdev and uh, Raj Guru are executed. In 1948, when uh, many of the same leaders who had signed on to the Karachi Resolution are now in the Constituent Assembly and are framing the Indian Constitution in, in November 1948, and the question of the abolition of the, cap uh, of the death penalty comes up. They, of course, point to Gandhi's assassination and say, you know, how can we do away with the death penalty? Um, this death penalty is, uh, is required. Otherwise, you know, if even a great man like Gandhi can be assassinated, we need some protection um, in our society. This is just to say that public mood is fickle. There is no necessarily principled basis on which the public is deciding what, uh, whether death penalty should be imposed or not. It is also unknowable by judges. How do judges know? As uh, you know, uh, one, uh, uh, one judgment of the Supreme Court said, judges don't have some divining rod to determine what the public mood uh, is. But also, the public mood is irrelevant to what judges do. There has to be some difference between what a judge does in a court and what a lynch mob does. There shouldn't be lynch mobs, but if there are, there has to be a difference between that. And the difference is that judges are supposed to de decide cases on the basis of, the, of whatever the law is, right? on legal principles, on the rule of the law. However, what judges have done is that they've read into the law the idea that society's cry for justice is a relevant consideration in deciding who should be given the death sentence. The collective conscience of the community is the phrase that they use, or society's cry for justice, is relevant in deciding whether someone should be given the death sentence or not. Now, this flies squarely in the face of the judgment where the court looked at the constitutionality of the death sentence, which is Bachchan Singh, and the court said, we cannot look at society's cry for justice. However, in subsequent cases, courts have said, no, we will look at society's cry for justice. We will, will look at the collective um, conscience. Uh, and on that basis, we will decide whether uh, the death penalty should be uh, given or not. Now, you can imagine the consequences of that. One, of course, that what the society's cry for justice is, or what the collective conscience of society really is, really depends on how the judge views that uh, situation. So it becomes very judge-centric, it becomes very arbitrary. I am not saying this. There are multiple Supreme Court judgments that have themselves recognized that this is what um, the death penalty uh, jurisprudence has become. Second, who do uh, judges see as being death-worthy? 
right? Who are these people that judges see are death worthy? Who it is? Uh, is it someone who um, kill who kills a Nirbhaya, or is it someone who um, attacks Bilkis Banu uh, and 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 kills her uh, family members? How are judges deciding these uh, questions? How do they determine who is capable of reform? Who is a threat to society? Who is not a threat to society? These are not objective yardsticks. They can never be. The human being and human lives are unknowable. They can never be. As a result, the attempts that the judiciary has made to make the death penalty system more objective, more fair, by bringing in more process, by bringing in more standards, more rules, etc., is bound to fail. Because ultimately, judges have to make this decision of who is death worthy right and uh, i'm so i'm just going to end i have a lot to say which we can uh, cover in our q and i'm just going to end by this um, with this quote uh, by justice blackman who's a who was a judge of the us supreme court and he he said uh, he used to uh, impose the death penalty etc and then at some point he said i can't do this anymore and so he says uh, in this case called callens versus collins he says from this day forward, I no longer shall tinker with the machinery of death. For more than 20 years, I have endeavored, indeed I have struggled along with the majority of this court, to develop procedural and substantive rules that would lend more than mere appearance of fairness to the death penalty endeavor, rather than continue to coddle the court's delusion that the desired level of fairness has been achieved and the need for regulation eviscerated, I feel morally and intellectually ob obligated to simply concede that the death penalty experiment has failed. It is virtually self-evident to me now that no combination of procedural rules or substantive regulations can ever save the death penalty from its inherent constitutional deficiencies. The basic question, does the system accurately and consistently determine which defendants deserve to die, cannot be answered in the affirmative. The problem is that the inevitability of factual, legal, and moral error gives us a system that we know must wrongly kill some defendants, a system that fails to deliver the fair, consistent, and reliable sentences of death required by the Constitution. I'll stop here. I have much more to say about the factors that make everything, you know, the entire system of the death penalty arbitrary and uh, court-centric, but perhaps we can take that up later. Um. Yeah, thank you, Aparna. Uh, I know, I mean, you have a lot more to say, but maybe we can address that in, um, in questions. Uh, it is interesting to see right from the Karachi, um, you know, from Karachi to the present times, you know, the, the feeling that, you know, there is a kind of, um, you know, constitutional stand, the constitutional takes a particular stand on uh, the death penalty, and that doesn't seem to be uh, reflected in a lot of the cases. Uh, that you discussed. And we see that also in the international arena. You have the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, where you have an optional protocol, which about, I think, 170 countries have either signed or have agreed to a, a moratorium on the death penalty. But we see that even at an international level, it is so difficult to actually uh, push forward to it, though um, the UN Human Rights Office does support uh, campaigns which tries, try to uh, you know, uh, prohibit the uh, death penalty. Uh, it has had limited success over uh, so many years. I think you've also sort of opened it out to looking at, you know, um, uh, what the procedures are and the constitutionality of some of these procedures. And I think, uh, Preeti, uh, we are hoping that you will take us through some of this in criminal law. Over to you. Um, thank you, Professor Pani, uh, Aparna, and Sarasu. Uh, I think that gives a very good segue into what I'm going to uh, speak about. And I want to begin uh, just by underscoring what my experience generally, like over the last seven, eight years of working with the criminal justice system and uh, speaking to different people now in the capacity of someone who teaches criminal law to undergraduate students at the National Law School. Uh, this disjunct that I see in public attitudes to all institutions concerning the criminal justice system at large and the death penalty, which seems to be completely uh, at a different footing. 
Now, uh, regarding the criminal justice system generally, we see uh, that general public opinion, there seems to be a consensus that there is vast scope for improvement. Institutions are not working to the best possible uh, capacity. There is widespread prevalence of torture, corruption, incompetence, uh, overwork overworked uh, police officers, lawyers, so on and so forth. The general consensus pushes us to think that, you know, perhaps the criminal justice system is not working. Perhaps there are parts of it that are broken uh, almost irreparably. On the other hand, when it comes to questions about the death penalty, somehow there's the consensus that even within this broken criminal justice system, the death penalty can be administered in a fair, non-arbitrary, consistent kind of a manner. And we seem to take great pride in the fact that we've given a fair trial to the accused, even those who have been hanged, that we are, uh, you know, a superior civilization because we are not barbaric, we are not hanging them without giving them a fair hearing. Uh, but I think there's a need to go beyond that. There's a need to question the nature of that uh, trial, the nature of that hearing, and what is it that uh, we are imagining as a fair trial, particularly when so many other aspects of our criminal justice system are admittedly not functioning. Now, this is not some general uh, lay person who is uh, making these claims, but uh, I mean, of course, that is there. We see that reflected in uh, like public outrage, protests, when some incident, some uh, violent rape that takes place in some part of the country or some terror attack. And we see constantly that, you know, the public demands uh, something like hanging the rapists or hanging the terrorist, and there should be no... Um, room for mercy. And that is what the legislature is now catering to, that for more and more crimes, politicians from across different political parties are saying that perhaps we should have the death penalty for acid attacks, perhaps we should have it for non-homicidal rape. In the Punjab, uh, in Punjab, they were considering it even for drug offenses. So these are uh, the kind of public sentiments that are being catered to, uh, also by the legislature. But even for uh, stakeholders from within the criminal justice uh, systems, like uh, as part of my work uh, with the National Law University Delhi, Project 39A, uh, we interviewed 60 former judges of the Supreme Court. And all of them admitted that, you know, there is widespread prevalence of torture, that the police do refer to, uh, resort to these illegal means of planting evidence, and uh, all of this gets admitted uh, before courts. And in the same breath, they said that if we abolish the death penalty, then the public will lose faith in the criminal justice system, that the deterrent effect of the punishment of the criminal justice system somehow would be lost. And it is this disjunct that is so shocking to me, that how, how come as, uh, like, you know, in, on one hand we say that the criminal justice system is broken, and on the other, re despite recognizing this, we are willing to have the death penalty in our statute books. That is the disjunct about which I hope to be able to speak a little more today. And this disjunct brings me directly to what uh, Professor Aparna was talking about, you know, uh, how subsequent judgments of the Supreme Court after Bachchan Singh uh, have constantly ruptured at this idea of the idealized, uh, individualized sentencing that was imagined when the death penalty was held constitutional in 1980. This confusion at the level of the Supreme Court uh, and also the High Courts, the Appellate Courts, has percolated down to the trial courts also. And this has very dangerous consequences for people who are being sentenced to death. Uh, as part of another study where I looked at 215 uh, trial court capital cases from Delhi, Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra uh, over a 16-year period from 2000 to 2015, what we found from among these 215 judgments is that 112 of them relied on collective conscience to impose the death penalty. And from among these 112, 63 cases did not mention any mitigating circumstances of the offender. So there was no consideration at all of the age of the accused, which is what something uh, that uh, uh, Professor Aparna mentioned, or even other factors like socioeconomic background, what, what their conduct in prison was like, None of these were considered. Now, how does this work? So basically what the courts are say, saying is that this crime is so brutal that it has shocked the collective conscience of the society and therefore we are going to impose the death penalty. As a result, all these mitigating factors that you're talking about, which could have been relevant at the time of sentencing, 
are not relevant in this case. So courts have been, trial courts have been doing it again and again, completely circumventing the legal safeguards that are in place to make way for collective conscience and public opinion. And that also ties in with what Professor Pani was saying about, you know, how the judiciary is kind of reflecting the opinion of the public without accounting for legal safeguards that are actually in place to prevent something like this from happening. Now, one might say, uh, what is so wrong if this is happening? Because, you know, these crimes are brutal uh, and it's only in the rarest of rare cases that the death penalty is imposed. Now, along with significant uh, constitutional concerns that Professor Apanna raised, I think it's also important when we are talking about something like this to uh, think about who gets the death penalty. Who are these people who are on death row? And towards that, uh, there is some research uh, which is published by NLU Delhi in the Death Penalty India report, pub which was published in 2016. Now, uh, they interviewed all prisoners sentenced to death across India, and they found that 74.1% of all death row prisoners came from socio-economically vulnerable backgrounds. 84.6% of them did not complete primary education or never attended school. And 63% of them were significant contributors to family income, 35% of them being sole earners of their family. Now, why is this important? This is important because it has profound consequences on their experience with the criminal justice system, the kind of lawyers they get, their experience with the police, how the police uh, looks at their rights at the time of arrest, or how it treats their family members. And once we start digging deeper, uh, we come to realize that what Stephen Wright said of the American legal system in the early 90s is true for India as well. That you get the death penalty not for committing the worst crime, but for having the worst lawyer. And that brings me back to the initial point that I raised, that in this kind of a criminal justice system, can we ever be sure that, you know, can we ever be sure of any conviction to the extent that we say we are going to take away somebody's life and we are so sure, we are so confident that this is the person who has done it and this is exactly what they deserve. Now, I'm not even going into questions of who should get the death penalty, who is capable of reformation and these are points that Apanna raised and of course a judge can never make the determination uh, as to who is capable of reformation and who is not. But even without going into those questions, the criminal justice system has enough uh, cracks as it stands today to not be able to withstand a punishment like the death penalty. And I think that is what uh, kind of compels us to think about uh, whether as a system, as a legal system, I mean, I'm speaking of India, but the same argument has been raised in other jurisdictions as well, that as a legal system, can we withstand something like the death penalty? Can we afford to have something like the death penalty? And uh, particularly around mitigating circumstances of the offender, given the way in which trial courts and even appellate courts have been going, uh, the Supreme Court recently has been pushing towards, you know, recognizing mitigating factors. In 2022, uh, the Supreme Court in Manoj versus State of Madhya Pradesh said that, you know, you cannot impose the death penalty without taking into account mitigating circumstances. And this was something that was said in Bachchan Singh diluted over the years, now again being reiterated in terms of criminal process. Uh, so they are saying that, you know, factors like the social and personal history of the accused, uh, their cultural background, their psychological uh, uh, background, all of these become relevant. Now, as someone who's familiar with the criminal justice system, I, I can't help wondering the kind of Herculean effort that will be required in gathering this material. How do we expect a lawyer to drop their practice in some court in India and go off to a prison to meet their client? Prisons are anyway in far off places away from the city. Queue up for that mulakat, that meeting process, drop their entire practice for the day and maybe like, you know, day over day and gather this material. And even more fundamentally, once a lawyer gathers this material, are we like uh, equipped to deal with it? And uh, since, I mean, I think we are not, as, as legal professionals, we are not. And that, I think, makes it even more questionable. How can we afford to have the death penalty when we can't even 
enforce a system which tries to enforce it, administer it in a fair and consistent manner. And I hope to be able to go into uh, many more of these points in detail across like, the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Preeti. And uh, I'm reminded, I mean, as a, as a human rights person myself of, you know, general com comment uh, 36 on Article 6 of the mm -hmm. International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which try to set down, among other things, you know, safeguards for the use of death penalty, recognizing that, you know, instant abolition may not be uh, possible. And it makes me wonder how far, uh, you know, those safeguards have been after listening to Aparna and you. Uh, wondering how far that those safeguards have even been met. Um, but since today we are uh, remembering Gandhi, I uh, thought, Professor Pani, maybe you could uh, speak a little on uh, Gandhi's method. Actually, the arg argument Gandhi makes is, is built around the idea not just of, uh, of the fact that you could go wrong, though that is a critical part of the argument or the initial part of it, because Gandhi believed that there was no such, there, there was an absolute truth, but that absolute truth was God. And individuals can only hope to attain that when they became one with God, which didn't happen. So essentially, we were functioning only with relative truth. And if you're functioning with relative truth, there is always a chance that you would go wrong. But this argument against the death penalty was not just based on that. Because it was built into his idea of morality itself that essentially he defined what he called a, a non-moral position, a moral position, and an immoral position. An immoral position was when you went against existing norms of morality. A non-moral position was when you were consistent with those mor norms of morality, but you didn't have any sacrifice involved. You didn't, you didn't have to give any, make any sacrifice in order to uh, take that position. A moral position only came up when, you were, when, your, uh, when your position was moral and backed by sacrifice. And it was then that it became what he called Satyagraha, the force of, of truth. And it is that element which is critical to his argument, because for him, the idea of reformation is linked to Satyagraha. If you are going to go in for punishment or for or killing people who have killed others, you're not going to be able to have a moral, you lose the moral battle even with the people who have committed murder. You need to win that moral, moral battle Otherwise, you cannot really go forward. In fact, he, this is something that underlies all his work, but he believed that power is of two kinds. One is obtained, I'm quoting here, one is obtained by the fear of punishment and the other by acts of love. Power based on love is a thousand times more effective and permanent than the one derived from fear of punishment. And this is critical to his position on, on the death penalty. So it's both in terms of reforming the criminal as well as his argument that he would, uh, that you would actually lose the moral battle each time you enforce the death penalty, and you create. And I think if you look at Indian society today, the, the sort of bloodthirstiness of society as a whole is a confirmation of this, uh, of, of this understanding. In fact, when when he was assassinated, two of his sons, uh, Ramdas Gandhi and Manilal Gandhi, had appealed, wrote letters, separate letters asking for uh, that God say not be uh, not uh, not be given the death penalty and uh, this was the kind of argument they were making in various in various uh, in different words but broadly this was the kind of argument but by then the national movement had moved as was pointed out earlier far away from the earlier uh, positions certainly far away from Gandhi you would see it in the post independence period in other areas also but by, at the time of the assassination itself, Gandhi's ideas were completely neglected. And in fact, uh, the reaction of all the leaders, Nehru included, was, uh, was completely uh, rejected the letters by Gandhi's sons. And in fact, uh, Sardar Patel was believed to have provide, to have come up with a very angry response saying that they don't need to teach him anything about the Mahatma. So you had a, a, a situation where you gave in on the on that idea of of punishment, of uh, of actually punishment being something that you reciprocate or you or you take a revenge. The idea of revenge as a part of punishment is something that was sowed uh, right then when Gandhi was assassinated, and we are seeing we are reaping it today in the form of the rise of pro Godse movements. Uh, thank you so much for that. I mean, I was, while you're speaking, I was thinking of, you know, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And, 
you know, I think we have moved to that situation. So we are a far cry from uh, the Karachi resolution, a far cry from uh, Gandhi himself when we uh, speak of this issue today. So I'm not going to Aparna first, but what I'm going to do here is, you know, ask Preeti a few question, then questions and then ask you what the Constitution says about it. And uh, Preeti, the first question I had for you is, you know, you spoke about mitigation. And I was just curious, you know, today when we look at uh, mitigating factors, Aparna already pointed out a lot of cases and so did you on, you know, where the death penalty was given, where the death penalty was not given. Um, you know, so I'm just going to ask you a uh, point blank, what are these mitigating circumstances? Are they any and are they being consistently used? So, um, yes. uh, so thanks, Arasu, for that question. I actually wanted to talk about it a little more, but uh, time was up uh, as I was speaking. So uh, the idea of bringing in mitigating circumstances into the Indian uh, capital sentencing jurisprudence, that comes again from... Uh, Bachchan Singh, which uh, held the death penalty to be constitutional in 1980, and laid down a framework, a sentencing framework for subsequent courts to follow, where it said that it's not going to be only circumstances of the crime or brutality of the crime that's going to determine what is the punishment that should be given, but also circumstances of the offender, mitigating circumstances. What was the age of the accused? What kind of a background they came from? Whether there's you know any scope for reformation, so on and so forth. And the idea behind this, as in like most sentencing systems which have place for mitigating circumstances, is that the court should know the individual that they are sentencing. Now, in this case, it is a sentencing to death, but in other cases, it can be sentencing to any punishment. So who is this individual that you are punishing and uh, what are the circumstances that they come from? That is the idea behind uh, having mitigating circumstances presented before uh, any court that decides between life imprisonment and the death penalty. Now, how it has been implemented or enforced over the years, that picture is really dismal. And uh, study after study shows that uh, most cases uh, do not consider mitigating circumstances. And even when they do, it's done in a very superficial manner. That, you know, the accused was uh, young or the accused was old without, like, getting into why that age is relevant, what scope that holds for reformation. None of these factors are taken into account. What is their socioeconomic background? What would be the consequence on the family members of the accused if we hang this person? Not just like uh, psychologically, but also financially. So, and a number of these considerations should be taken into account. Now, recently, the Supreme Court has been pushing for factors such as the social and personal history, psychological background, including factors like intellectual disability, which do not make the cut for the insanity defense under the Indian Penal Code, but which may nonetheless have some bearing on determining the sentence. Now, as a researcher, I've seen that, you know, uh, prisoners on death row, their psychological state of being that is far from, uh, you know, uh, being okay. But we see judges being so um, dismissive sometimes about it that, you know, of course, if you're in prison, you're going to be depressed, is what a judge had once remarked in court about, like, you know, when I was present there. And there's a complete lack of sensitivity almost, and perhaps a uh, lack of ability to be able to judge and evaluate that material and understand its consequences on uh, an individual's life and the sentence that they are carrying. Uh, along, I, and because it's like today and we are remembering uh, Gandhi's assassination, I think a very like heartbreaking kind of incident comes to mind where you know, uh, many of the prisoners that I've met, they write this exam called Gandhi Vichar Parishad Pariksha. And they are so happy that uh, they've written this exam. So when you meet them, me and uh, my colleagues as well, that they proudly come and show these certificates. You know, I, uh, I've learned how to read and write. This is the exam that I passed. And as a researcher, I've sometimes wanted to share the joy of, you know, oh, this is such a good thing that has happened. And they never got a chance to do this outside uh, uh, of prison. But somewhere it's also heartbreaking because you realize that a judge down the line when it comes to a sentencing hearing may not even take that into consideration and may just say that, oh, all prisoners write this exam, there's nothing special about it. So these are the kind of factors that perhaps 
should have a bearing on the sentence that is imposed on uh, any prisoner, particularly prisoners on death row, but the reality is far from ideal. Uh, thank you, uh, Preeti. So, uh, Aparna, you said you would like to speak about factors a little later. I think that's closely linked yeah. to what Preeti has just said. So, um, If I could start, though, just reflecting on something that Professor Pani was saying, uh, two things. I, I was remembering um, as you were, when you were talking about how you lose the moral force of your argument by uh, imposing the death penalty, that there used to be this famous saying in the abolitionist movement at some point that... Um, how does it make sense to kill people, to teach people that killing people is wrong? Um, but, but you talked about what the impact of having something like the death penalty uh, being enforced has on society and society's understandings of justice. And I want to flip that around and say, you know, what is the impact that um, removing the death penalty has on people's perception of justice. We've seen, we have examples of this. We've had examples of what has happened in countries that have, have abolished the death penalty. I can give you two examples out of UK and France, where popular opinion at the time when the death penalty was abolished was very much pro-death penalty, that death penalty should be retained. Sub and there have been, you know, um, close to when the abolition took place, there was a lot of uh, hue and cry about the abolition. Uh, in the Im years immediately following, uh, there were various attempts to bring back the death penalty. But more recent studies, and, you know, this happened in the 1980s in both countries, in recent studies, they found that today there is very little public support for the death penalty, right? There's uh, uh, also people's own understanding of what is justice and even what is revenge. Right? If, even if revenge is what is motivating people, what would be the punishment that counts as justice is shaped by what is the highest punishment that is available in the system. So removing the death penalty can also have an impact of uh, changing people's perceptions of what is just, what is unjust. It won't happen overnight, but that's something uh, that does happen. I wanted to say something about... Um, you know, the test itself, and again, society's cry for justice, or the other factors that go into looking at what is aggravating, what is mitigating, whether the Bachchan Singh standard of rarest of rare case, where every other, um, where the uh, option of reform is completely foreclosed, that's the standard Bachchan Singh uh, puts for the death penalty. How fallible that is. I've already said that the Supreme Court itself recognized, not in one case, in multiple cases, that it's getting death sentencing completely wrong. In fact, it's going to begin hearing a case this year uh, to say how can we bring in some rigor into death penalty because it's it's completely all over the place. But in between 2000 and 2013, the Supreme Court affirmed or imposed the death penalty in 69 cases. So there are many, many more cases that are given the death penalty at the trial court levels, at the high court levels. By the time they come to the Supreme Court, most of them are commuted. Uh, but in 69 cases, the Supreme Court gave the death penalty. These are not people, these are cases. The Supreme Court has itself found and held that in this period, 16 out of the 69 cases, it had imposed the death penalty wrongly. 16 out of the 69 cases there's not 69, 16 people, 16 uh, cases. It had imposed the death penalty wrongly. Some of the pe those people have been executed. Some of those people, years after the Supreme Court had said that the death penalty was wrongly decided, their mercy petitions were rejected and they were fighting it out still in, in, uh, in court. Dhananjay Chatterjee, who was executed, the Supreme Court subsequently said that he was wrongly given the death sentence. And Dhananjay Chatterjee's case continues to be cited by the Supreme Court to impose the death penalty. So that is the level at which we are talking about a broken criminal justice system, a broken legal system. This is not even the criminal justice system. This is a broken system altogether. Um, one, I mean, two other very small facts. Um, of all the cases, uh, you know, at the high court level uh, where, where the death penalty was given and it was, uh, and there was an appeal to the Supreme Court, 28% of, in 28% of those cases, the Supreme Court acquitted the person, didn't take a different view on the death penalty, said this person wasn't even guilty of the offense, 28%. So that is just to give a sense of how broken the criminal justice system is. 
a third of the people where the Supreme Court gives, affirms the death penalty, a third of those people are represented by legal aid lawyers. A third of that. That's much higher than what your general standard of, if you've gone up to the Supreme Court, generally, uh, it means that you have some level of uh, support. It's much higher than what you have otherwise in the criminal justice system. So just to say that it's, there is a fallibility that is built into the criminal justice system. There is corruption of the criminal justice system. There is, but there is a, an absolute lack of standards in the death penalty system. So whatever else we may think of, of our legal system, whether we think it's good, bad, whatever, we should know that by no means are we anywhere even close to imposing the death penalty in a way that is even minimally fair. Right? So I'm not even getting into the question of whether the person did it, did not do it, etc. Our system is not even minimally fair. And again, it's not just me saying it. If it's the court itself that's recognizing it, you can imagine uh, how bad the thing, things might be that the court itself is recognizing that it's getting things absolutely wrong. Thank you, uh, yeah, thank you Aparna. I think, uh, I think both of you have uh, stressed on the fact that you know, the criminal justice system is not working. And uh, you know whether we say rarest of rare cases or you know talking about procedural justice, these don't seem to be there. Um, but I would like to uh, circle back to the the rightness of and wrongness of rather uh, the death penalty itself. And uh, certainly we have seen that in its working. I mean I think from all three panelists that uh, it simply isn't working, or it is, uh, or certain people are overrepresented in its working, so to speak, and they uh, you know without. But no coincidence, they seem to be uh, from uh, the poorer uh, sections. And, um, you know, Preeti took us uh, through a profile of sorts. Uh, I just wanted to circle back to Professor Pani for some uh, few final uh, comments. And then if there's something, then I will open it up to the other participants as well. Um, I think, you know, uh, both what Preeti and Aparna said, you know, goes back to what you initially started off with. Uh, to look at caste and nepotism in the system, and also uh, talking about you know how social pressures would influence um, uh, the course of justice. Um, there have been cases where the con the courts have pointed out that you know we are not bound by social pressures; we are bound by a higher constitutional morality, um, and we see that many of these cases that seems to be uh, missing, or at least not talked about. And I was wondering, um, you know, how far do you see, uh, you know, Gandhi's ideals in our constitution today? And uh, where do you see us going uh, in the near future? Uh, what is the course that we are going to be taking? I think the idea that uh, Gandhi's ideals would be in the con constitution was, di was dismissed as early as 1945. And Nehru, in fact, wrote to Gandhi saying that what he has in mind is something that uh, that doesn't make uh, any rational sense. And he himself had, had said that he will stay with his ideas but not enforce it on the Congress party. And in fact, he, uh, Nehru has a detailed letter where he says that this is all very well for philosophy, but it's not going to work in politics. So there's a complete rejection of Gandhi as far as that, well before independence itself. And Gandhi was, was quite aware of that. But what has happened uh, well, since then is really a vindication of Gandhi's argument that you cannot manage a society by ignoring its morality. The argument that essentially you can identify uh, economic justice with growth, or you can work out elements and take a society forward in whatever broad criteria you have of power or anything else. You cannot uh, achieve that if you completely leave the moral issue outside. And this is something where you can see, of course, in the death penalty, the rise of court, say, as, a, as an acceptable figure. They're making films on him now. And the fact is a, is a comment on the fact that we have completely lost the moral war, the moral edge. We are now at a level where if morality doesn't matter, then why should court say be a criminal? Right? It's not just at that level. It's when you go down to it, you see uh, a sense of it at, in every aspect of your life today, whether you're looking at, uh, at specific cases of uh, in the stock market today or in the, in the commercial milieu, wherever we are looking at it, the moral edge no longer matters, no longer seems to matter. 
but that kind of an approach is beginning to uh, to have its impact because you have, if you're not trusted it, it, any it is something that economists are recognizing now and they are among the last to recognize it that a society can cannot function without morality when i go to a restaurant uh, unless it's an udupi restaurant i eat first and pay later there is a trust that i will not walk out after eating there is a certain level of basic morality that is there in any in any basic uh, economic functioning if you lose that morality you begin to the economy itself begins to crumble we are seeing it in a case that is uh, in the headlines today but you'll see it in in every other aspect so the challenge really is is the death penalty and the problems with it is reflective of a larger thinking that dominated uh, a society after independence across the board it's not a, any party that comes to pass were firmly believed that morality was something to be kept in the uh, to be kept for drawing rooms or other areas within it that essentially you did what you could and you and you uh, got what you did you you were measured ultimately by your economic or or so success or social status you were not measured your contribution was not going to be measured by the moral process that you used to that what we are seeing around us today the widespread disorder whether in the political domain whether in the social domain whether, where we you have people being uh, just uh, people collecting yesterday i think or day before there was a case in bihar where people were collecting donations for some festival a rickshaw driver said he didn't have the money refused to pay and they killed him now this is of an enforcement of a death penalty for a perceived injustice of not being paid right and this is the level to which it has come where we are completely down to lynching on our level now if we keep the two separate and treat that penalty as some kind of a legal issue alone obviously it's a legal issue and i think the co panelists have brought that out but if you treat it as a legal issue alone and not a way of life that we seem to have accepted right then we don't really recognize what the death penalty has done to our society and what it has done to us and uh, i think that is really the bigger danger today uh, thank you for that i think uh, you are upna you want to respond to me no no i i just to want that. to add to that uh, to say that you know one of the things that we are seeing is this this wider what you call the degradation of 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 society those morals also coming into the law in a, in a different ways so we've talked about the judiciary but um, the increasing legislation of enactment of death penalty in different laws um so the the um you know sir so talked about the international human rights regime and the one thing that the international human rights regime does say is that you have to either you have to restrict the death penalty right to the most heinous offenses that you can't have it as an ordinary punishment that as far as possible uh, reduce its use or uh, impose a moratorium india over the last few years has just been increasing the use of the death penalty and every time you having you can you spoke about massacres every time you have a massacre or a riot or a um, or some heinous uh, you know public outcry the response of the 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 quick response of the legislature is to introduce a death penalty you see that in uh, in the in case of ri- child rape in the case of sexual offenses more broadly but also to regulate a range of other things so airport you know hijacking um, uh, your um, oil rigs and platforms uh, uh, you know uh, ensuring that there's security for it for non homicidal offenses i mean that's the the way in which the death penalty is used as a balm over you know again society's cry for justice society cries for justice in many different ways it seeks some accountability and what they get is the death penalty right as a as a uh, as a substitute for accountability and i think just like you know as uh, like uh, adding on to that thought about what it means to have like a uh, to to have morality reflect in our legal system or you know the legal system reflecting the morals of the society i mean i was wondering why mitigation or like you know mitigating factors generally the kind of safeguards that we have in place why courts have not been able to uh, you know do justice to that kind of a sentencing framework and uh, this takes me back to something that uh, brian stevenson who uh, has uh, you know is of just mercy fame his book now has become a movie and he represents people sentenced to death in the uh, us 
and he says how this is important like you know it's able uh, it's important for courts to know whom they are sentencing because each of us is defined by more than our worst mistake and if as a society we are not able to think about an individual beyond their worst mistake what does it say about us collectively and i think that like everything that professor pani spoke about like you know the degrading morals of the society and us thinking about everything in very like retributive vengeful terms that is kind of making way for a less i mean less compassionate is a very polite way of saying this like a completely uh, ruthless cruel kind of a legal system which has absolutely no space for understanding individual circumstances of an accused or a defendant or even like respecting the rights of a victim in a criminal justice system so these are things that we are not taking into account we are not taking into account like what the victim's family goes through or like what the accused's family goes through we are not as a legal system or as a society these are not things we are concerned with at all and it doesn't seem to me that even courts are concerned with something like this it's just something that is considered to be beyond their scope of like you know consideration at all um thank you for that uh, i think uh, the three panelists have given us a lot to think about uh, moving from uh, gandhi to uh, the morality of uh, uh, you know our society today and to the constitution and to the criminal justice system so we can open it out for questions for uh, some time may i request you to identify yourself if you have a question to ask um all right i see three hands there is that there a mic that we can pass around thank you um this is supriya roy chaudhary and currently at nias um <clears throat> thanks for a really nice discussion but um i understood the panel to be critical of capital punishment as as it should be as all of us are <clears throat> but let me say that for uh, apna and preeti the argument that i got was your very carefully crafted critique of the criminal justice system of the legal just of the legal system more broadly and that <clears throat> capital punishment or the death penalty falls a victim to this and therefore is deeply flawed as is the criminal justice system but um if i can put a more if i can sort of push you to 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 consider that your arguments really left me wondering what is your moral position then on on capital punishment per se not contextualized in a flawed criminal justice system what would be the tipping point beyond which you would think that a capital punishment system or a death penalty is justified that's one my second question is to uh, narendra pani because you brought in the question of morals and morality <clears throat> and as someone who delves deeply into philosophy i thought i would ask you this that if we think of capital punishment not only in the context of crime or wrong doing but in the cont- as a in the context of the concept of of an offense that offends the morality of society of civilization and if we could compress that into thinking about the problem of evil in society then my question is that is there a way in which the capital punishment problematic which is deeply deeply problematic deeply complex is there a way in which the capital punishment problematic can be contextualized in the conceptual problem of how does a society or how does even an individual or a community confront the problem of evil is there a way <coughs> in other words that we can think of of the destruction of evil which you know has been spoken of in religion has been spoken of by mystics but in literature in social commentaries so on and so forth there is there is it's an, it it is not what preeti and apna talked about the the social clamor for vengeance or the social clamor for justice but a, a a deeper engagement with the problem of evil but is there a way in which 
uh, from, the, from the perspective of morality, one can think of capital punishment and even, sorry, if this is too <laughs> complex. Thank you, panelists. Uh, I, this is Shashank. I had two questions. One was about uh, the idea that um, the Indian system uh, and its degradation. I was thinking of degradation from where? Um, hasn't been the uh, Indian society worked on the idea of cap uh, of um, vengeful uh, attacks as the morality, as uh, if we can call it in the sense of morality, um, be it prior to the uh, uh, institution of constitution or even as rightly pointed out, uh, even from Gandhi's uh, assassination. So in both the sense, from where? The second question that I was uh, thinking about is... Uh, uh, can we just take one more question and then we yeah. can come back in case there are. Uh, I believe this is uh, to Professor Pani because he spoke about the degrading models of society. Good evening, panelists. Uh, my question is basically with respect to constitutional law. Uh, when we talk about death penalty, we as it is face a lot of grey area and that is why this discussion is also on. So. In the constitution, we come across this legal conundrum, which is between the executive and the legislature. The legislature, of course, has the mandate to provide for capital punishment in the, um, in the deserving cases, uh, which they deem fit. But on the other hand, the executive, especially the constitutional authorities like the president and the governor, have also been given a huge amount of discretion to finally allow a death penalty to be uh, given or not. So. And especially keeping in mind the context of Bilkis Banu's case, it brought out that conundrum very, very evidently. So I think that is one grey area which I would like you to comment on a bit. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very uh, tall order, so I don't know how much we will be able to cover on that. Uh, there are a couple of questions here and then two there, Should and then I think we will respond. I think we'll start forgetting the questions. questions? OK, questions. then maybe we'll just take, a, yeah, maybe two more and then. Uh, Thank you. Been a lot of uh, very higher level questions uh, from the audience. Mine is a rather more legalistic question. Uh, of course, thanks a lot for the discussion, which put through a lot of uh, light on the current status of our criminal justice system. But my question is to do with the fact that this expression, rarest of rare cases, which uh, was pronounced by the Supreme Court in the Bachchan Singh case, by not fleshing it out to mean anything. It has been left to a lot of interpretations, especially at the lower levels of judiciary, where the rarest of rare cases, uh, you know, the, the expression itself is often understood to mean there are more rare, there are more, there are more rarest of rare cases coming from the lower level judiciary than the higher level judiciary. So this is a question which I thought I could ask here. Yeah. Just to make the point that uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Tananjit Chatterjee case, uh, the president then was, uh, in 2004, was uh, APJ Abdul Kalam. He many years later uh, expressed uh, regret for having uh, signed off on the, on the death penalty. And also uh, two researchers from the uh, Indian Stat Statistical Institute, they concluded that he was, uh, yeah. you know, framed. Uh, maybe you could respond, uh, Professor Pani. So the issue of capital punishment uh, and evil, uh, there, are, there are of course two questions there. One is what is evil and then how do you confront it? Now what is evil in a changing society, the notion of evil itself changes. As uh, you have a certain set of beliefs, a certain uh, set of values that build into it, and anything that goes fundamentally against it becomes, uh, would be something that would be rejected as a, as a moral position. So one way of addressing that is to take uh, positions that are uh, that would be uh, considered evil even under under multiple societies, right? The right to kill, uh, basic elements: thou shalt not kill. If you want a certain set of basic rules, that itself will be debatable, but it's possible to get a broad kind of, if not a consensus, at least a broad set of criteria that you can use in that in deciding what is evil. How to, uh, how to confront evil is where the real debate comes about. Where can a measure that's evil in itself be a, a source of confronting evil? And I think capital punishment is a classic case of that. That can the taking of life 
be an effective measure to, uh, to, uh, to actually stop somebody else from taking a life. And that, there is reason to doubt that can happen because each time you do it, you lose the moral edge. The moral battle that once you are taking a life, you are accepting that it is a valid means of addressing a conflict or addressing a perceived injustice. And if others believe that they are going through an injustice, as you would see in many of these uh, Hindi movies, that I know what's going to happen, but I do it and take the sacrifice of a penalty from that. Right? So there is a certain moral edge that's being lost in the entire criminal, uh, uh, criminal justice system. So how to fight it is something. Gandhi, of course, took the view that you could only fight it through a moral position, a, mo a moral position which includes not just a, a morally correct position, but a sacrifice behind it. And that is what would sort of push even the evil to have to consider it. And the point that uh, Rosa Parna made about uh, essentially uh, what happened in, in England or in, mm -hmm. uh, in Britain, etc., when the up after the abolition of the death penalty is a, is a confirmation in that sense of what of what Gandhi of what Gandhi said. So I think there is a certain strength in his argument that. Uh, that when you use evil to confront evil, you're going to only make it worse. And I think India is a living case case of that. On uh, Shashank's question on on degradation, there are multiple factors in a changing society that call put it under pressure. But one major thing that we in this context of this discussion is the conflict between constitutional morality and the morality that people accept on the ground. I think the the constitution was uh, had both the strengths and weakness of being made by people who were uh, who were more advanced in their ethical standards as well as in their in their understanding you could call it advanced but you could also challenge it in some sense because it was very insensitive in many ways to what it, what are the values that were held on the ground that it was for instance it remains very uh, very uh, sensitive to class divisions but much less sensitive to social divisions including caste Right, so much so that when the Supreme Court decided on the reservation issue and they decided they needed to put a, uh, put a creamy layer slab, the slab they used was an economic slab, though the whole case for reservations is based on social stigma. Right. So you have a situation where that conflict is nowhere near being resolved. So you have situations where, if I may just take a minute, I'll give you one example. Like, for instance, you had a large-scale thing on land reform on taking land and giving it to the, uh, from the landlord and giving it to the tenant. This included in, in Karnataka, cases of small farmers who didn't have money leasing out their land to the village uh, large landlord who had the money to cultivate, right? They also lost land on the, right? So you have a moral dilemma there because you have a consideration on the ground, I think. And even now, uh, tenancy has returned in a big way. Right, so what happens to the law that says tenants are, tenancy should be abolished? So you're in a situation where these moral debates are not emerging. The law is being made independent of that. When even in a something like the Women's Reservation Bill, the law is changed first, or the attempt is made to change the law first, rather than trying to change, uh, change the conditions on the ground. And that conflict will ensure there's a continuous degradation of, the, of this process. Thank you, and also thank you for that example. Um, which order would you like to go in? Because I think the questions are intermixed. Yes. Thanks. Um, on the question of um, my own views on the capital punishment, uh, regardless of the procedural elements involved, I mean, as a constitutional lawyer, I think of it as a question of state power. What kind of power should the state hold? Should the state have the power to deprive someone of their life? And I think. Uh, I think not. I don't think, I think there are dangers beyond the capital punishment to saying that the state should have so much power that it can decide to extinguish life, voluntarily, cold-bloodedly extinguish life. I think that's dangerous, uh, both in terms of the signals that it sends to society, which Professor Pani has talked about, but it is also dangerous in terms of the kind of power that, that then it gives the state, right, that, that, that power of life and death. Um, I think the second question is, what does the capital punishment say about how people should be treated? Right? The idea that, on the one hand, that there are people who are beyond reform, who can never 
be reformed. What does that say about how we view human beings? And I think that's incredibly problematic to, to say that there are some people that at some point we give up on people. I think that's, that's incredibly uh, problematic for my worldview, but also incredibly problematic for the state to say that I can give up on someone. Um, and the final uh, point would be that we are all a product of society. The best, our be best impulses, our worst impulses are produced not by us alone, but in interaction with society. What the death penalty does is it individual, individualizes the um, consequences of, of something that I've done. Whereas most of my positive actions, uh, the benefits are both to me individually uh, as well as socialized. And I think, I mean, again, that's, that's uh, problematic. On the executive legislature question, um, yes, so the executive as the, the president and the governor of the power to commute, and of course um, you gave the example of Kalam's regret over Tananjay um, Chatterjee. Um, I used to work at the National Judicial Academy and there was a, a retreat for, the, for Supreme Court judges and, um, and President Kalam uh, had come to address the, uh, the Supreme Court. And he said, um, and this is, he expressed the same regret. And then he said that, you know, I have all these matters that are pending before me, and all of them, barring none, is from a very marginalized uh, part of uh, society, very poor, economically, socially marginalized. What does that say about the death penalty system? that uh, when was the last time that a rich man got the death penalty? And I mean, he asked the Supreme Court judges, the entire court was there. When was the last time a, a rich man got the death penalty before you? And no one had an, had an example. So I mean, just to say, therefore, that there is, there is this concern. The concern with the executive is on what basis does the executive decide whether to give the death penalty or not. For better or for worse, there is some framework that the judiciary has, which is the rarest of rare case. For the executive, I think for good reason, the idea is that the executive might have to take a call based on other factors, not, non, not necessarily legal factors to decide whether, to, whether the death penalty should be carried out or um, not. But it's a complete black box. There's no sort of standards by which you one knows whether the executive has rightly or wrongly rejected one's, uh, uh, there's, there's no obligation to give reasons side. Like Right? So I mean, it's at that, at that level of a black box, and I think that's, that's again incredibly problematic for what that says about state power. Ultimately, you are a constitutional functionary, so you're responsible to the constitution. That means that there has to be reason giving, there has to be accountability for any action that you take as a, as a constitutional um, lawyer. Finally, on the rarest of rare um, case, the question of how it is to be interpreted, it's interesting the Supreme Court itself said in this one case, they said, you know, the problem with the rarest of rare cases, I should know my case, how that case relates to the entire universe of other cases where the death penalty has been given. Is it a non-rare case? Is it a rare case but not the rarest case? Is it the rarest of rare case? No single judge in the country can, can ever know that. Right? That is why so much of this, the, the entire formula is incredibly unworkable. In practice, um, there are about 130 death penalties that are given at the trial court level every year, which means every third day, approximately, uh, there's a death penalty that is being given. Many of these cases, by the time they reach the Supreme Court, their judges, some judges have given the death penalty, other judges have acquitted on the same facts. There are cases at the Supreme Court level where one judge acquits, the other judge says, no, this person should be given the death penalty. Just to say that it's not even at the level of saying that, you know, we have some difference of opinion as to whether this is rare, not rare enough. This, this, we are working in a, in a system that is so broken that, uh, that I don't know how you work that system at all, right? Even if it was a perfect system, the whole conceptual problem with the rarest of rare case uh, uh, remains. But we're not even just in the realm of pure, pure conceptual problems. Um, regarding the uh, first question about, you know, my moral position on the death penalty and capital punishment. So I remember coming to this research uh, at a time when the rhetorics around the death penalty were very 
uh, like the debate was hot and uh, the case of Kasab was being very uh, like hotly debated, not even debated, I think the public sentiment was very much that, you know, we, that there was a certain pride that we gave a terrorist, we even gave a terrorist a free and fair hearing, what more can you expect of us as a civilization and this is exactly what he deserved. And that to me was somehow very disturbing that for someone so young, we are willing to say that again, like giving up on someone or saying that only this one individual is responsible for the kind of harms that we suffered as a country, as a society. And not the, that collective renunciation of any responsibility of how we reached this point, how we led someone to become this person, how we, how we are in some ways responsible for paving that path, those questions were never raised. And I thought those were important. That is why, that is how I came to that research personally. But having again worked in this system for uh, seven, eight years, I have become more cynical, more critical of the criminal justice system. And today to me, it's not just a capital punishment problem within the criminal justice system, but it's almost as if day in, day out, I'm facing a completely morally bankrupt legal system and I'm not able to find solutions to anything within that system. And that today is nudging me away from uh, solutions within that criminal legal system and making me think outside of it in terms of particularly how black feminists in the US have been moving towards, uh, you know, abolition, not just capital punishment abolition, but like penal abolition generally. And that, I mean, there's a lot to be said about the institution of prisons, whether they are uh, really spaces which are encouraging people to uh, return to society as reformed individuals or not. And so that to me, like, you know, is currently my moral position that it's not just about the capital punishment, but broader concerns within the criminal uh, justice system and what role it plays in our society uh, broadly. Uh, regarding uh, the point about Dhananjay Chatterjee, I think uh, uh, while speaking to a practicing lawyer in Calcutta, he was telling me how uh, the wife of the then chief minister had actually taken out a demonstration demanding the death penalty and how that also uh, influenced public opinion that, uh, you know, yes, we should have the death penalty in this particular case, saying that the government is delaying it and the government should push for the death penalty. The state should actually demand death penalty. And this was coming from the chief minister's wife, which kind of added fuel to that uh, already burning fire. And again, uh, like, like you rightly pointed out, significant concerns with uh, the conviction which ultimately led to uh, execution of Dhananjaya Chatuji. Uh, the last point on rarest of rare cases and how, uh, how rarest of rare is to be interpreted, I think there is a good argument, a strong argument to be made that the vagueness, the ambiguity of Bachchan Singh, the language that it used or, you know, just the kind of loose framework that it uh, tried to create, that itself paved uh, the way for that confusion uh, which arose in the appellate courts and subsequently in the trial courts as well. Because of course it says mitigating circumstances should be taken into account and it has to be, there has to be a weighing exercise. Now how is a trial court supposed to conduct that weighing exercise? What is that weighing exercise? We, we don't know any of that because Bachchan Singh did not talk about uh, any of that. Like, uh, that the prosecution has to prove that the accused is uh, beyond reformation. How, how can it ever be proved that, you know, an individual is beyond reformation? Those are questions that Bachchan Singh did not uh, enter into. And I think that is what, that is where the fault lies somewhere that, you know, uh, subsequent judgments have been able to add factors like collective conscience, society's cry for justice, public opinion, all of which has, uh, like, Ultimately, the uh, system that we have, the framework that we have, is so far away from what Bachchan Singh envisioned. And maybe there is some, there is something to be said that you know that this stems from the ambiguity of Bachchan Singh itself. Um, we're almost at time, but there were a couple of hands at the right at the back. I think you have the mic with you. Please go ahead. Okay, I'll be short. Um, I'll just be, uh, you know, confined to Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, then Rajiv Gandhi's assassination. Okay, since we are remembering Gandhi, 
and based on three examples of the, 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 the act of killing and the capital punishment or the punishment per se, uh, my question is around the larger discourse of how the social interacts with the legal. You know, when we actually get into this, we see there is a strong interaction, but it is very subtle but overlooked, that there is a legitimacy of the act of killing and there is a legality of the capital punishment or the, you know, the legality of punishment. In both the cases, it may be very ironic, but then in the, both the cases that what you say there is a collective cry for justice. You know, uh, there is a, you know, the retributive justice aspect to it. Okay, because there is a strong sense of ethno-religious kind of you know, sentiment attached to both the kind of you know, cases. So when, you know, the justice seeking becomes a commonality, you know, uh, between the act of terror or act of killing, I, I would rather call it act of terror leading to killing, and the just, justice seeking in the kind of, you know, cap, in the punishment, how do, you know, it is but too obvious that one would be very, very confused. Right. And that is where to talk of morality, you know, I think the confusion here is not the degradation of morality, but the subjective use of moral standards, okay, by the legal, social and the intellectual. Thank you. Um, thank you for that comment. I'm afraid we don't have time for any more. Uh, okay, just one last one. Yeah, I'm Dilip Aoja, a private citizen. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it was a very one-sided panel. I mean, everybody agreed that death penalty is bad, uh, which is music to my ears, but still uh, we'd uh, like to hear something that f from the other point of view. But I just want to make one comment and maybe ask one question, is that if death penalty is abolished, you can bet you whatever money you have, that the Hyderabad type of incidents will increase, and as it happens in the US, the, the murders inside the prisons will go up on the guys who have committed the most rarest of the rarest or most heinous crimes. Uh, this has happened in the US, this happened in Nirbhaya case. You will find people dying in the because there is honor amongst thieves, there is honor amongst murderers. So there is a pecking order among murderers and they will kill the worst guys in the prison. And the police will, the prison officers will look along, will just look on. Uh, the question I have is, once death penalty is abolished, what do you do about killing in war? I mean, if taking of a human life is wrong, morally wrong, with legally wrong, constitutionally wrong. What about espionage and what about war? Is that okay? I mean, this was a line that even Gandhiji was not, who was an incrementalist, was not willing to cross. Thank you. Quick yeah, response. <laughs> I don't think we have time for any more questions, but one quick question. <laughs> Uh, just, just a quick response. I think that if you decide that the social values that a society comes with is a given case in response to both the Anshuman and, and the Lips question, if you take that as a given, then all your arguments would hold. Right? The essence of the Gandhian response is that those values are themselves changing. And as long as you use the state to support those values, to support the idea that you can function, uh, that revenge is good, that revenge is legitimate, then, then you cannot expect the criminals to change that. They will, of course, go along with it, and that's what they're doing. But uh, you can, as long, if you can separate, the, as long as you separate the criminal justice system from larger social values, you will have this problem. And I would, all as I'm trying to make the case today is that India is a classic example of what happens when you have that separation. When you think that you can, you can have a death penalty in your criminal justice system, and you think that society will all settle down into a, into a, into a perfectly law and order situation, it doesn't work. Sooner or later, the, the, the first the uh, death penalty idea from the criminal justice system extends to society, and over time, that pressure from society affects the just, uh, judicial system as well. So you're just reinforcing it. It is not an immediate one-on-one -on -one kind of situation. If you, can, if you give up on the, on the overall 
moral caliber of a society or the overall moral issue of society, then what both of you said is absolutely right. But I'm not sure that you can keep the moral issue out of it, particularly in India today when we are facing a crisis of this magnitude, when life is itself, you can be going on the streets on a, in a road rage case and get killed. Right? You're, you've brought your society down to that level, and I think it's time to look beyond uh, the current set of values. Can I say just one very brief thing in response sure. to this? Um, this is in response to Mr. Ahuja's uh, question. You know, um, one is, of course, both encounters and prison killings and violence continue to happen even with the death penalty on the board. But you took the example of the U.S., so I just wanted to say that in the U.S. there have been very interesting studies because in the U.S., of course, there are some states that have abolished the death penalty, others that have not. So it makes for a very good lab experiment, right, in, in terms of what happens when you abolish the death penalty. And the two things, there is no correlation with the mur between the murder rate and the um, whether the death penalty has been abolished or not. And second, there is no correlation between police violence and whether a death penalty has been abolished or not. I mean, to whatever extent, I, I, unless we think that there's something very peculiar about the US society where this happens and uh, Indians are a class apart, and you know, we could have a separate conversation on that. To the extent that we have evidence from other countries, including you know the 140 countries 20 odd countries that have abolished the death penalty or have uh, you know or don't practice it anymore. Um, there's something to be said that you know this this that so societal mores will change uh, also over time. Uh, they're not static. I, th I think the UK Royal Commission yeah. post, uh, like, you know, the uh, abolition of the death penalty uh, also conducted similar studies and did not find a correlation between Correct. crime rate and de death penalty being present in the statute books or not. Correct, yeah. Um, I mean, just to quickly bring this uh, to a close, um, I think, you know, when we are remembering uh, Gandhi today, I think it's heartening that the panel has clearly said that, uh, you know, the death penalty cannot stand on uh, moral grounds. And uh, personally, as a human rights person, I don't think there can be a greater violation of human rights uh, in terms of the state's own authorized uh, killing of a human being. Um, and I don't think that, you know, any person can do anything that would lead to them uh, forfeiting every right and this basic right as a human being. Uh, we've also seen, I think, uh, just to add to the last point, and something that has come up from one or two uh, people in the room is, you know, this entire deterrent value of the death penalty, I think, has been debunked. And there is enough literature out there for those who are interested uh, to look at that, that death penalty is not a deterrent uh, to crimes. Um, and even for those who are not swayed uh, by some of these arguments, I think uh, both Preeti and Aparna put forward a very uh, good case, um, a snapshot, if you will, of our criminal justice system to say that, you know, we ha have a very problematic system, a system that we all acknowledge does not work for cases um, like, you know, civil cases like, you know, trespass on property or consumer uh, disputes or even a matrimonial dispute which takes 20 or 30 years to settle. How can we suddenly believe that this system would be perfect when it comes to uh, handing out the death penalty. There are certainly, uh, you know, uh, problems in the system, and it is not working. And certainly, if we work it, we will justice will not be the end. I think the way to go about this, um, in keeping with the ideals that we're remembering on this day, is to start off with an immediate moratorium on uh, death penalty. To not have. Uh, the death penalty being imposed while we debate on these issues further as a country and, uh, you know, debating on it from perspectives of morality, uh, from perspectives of constitution and human rights, uh, to finally come up with, you know, what our stand should be. And of course, I think all of us uh, here probably feel very strongly that it should be abolished. But I think a morat moratorium would be a good way and a modest way uh, to begin. So thank you all for making the effort to come here. And I would like to personally thank all the panelists for their rich uh, discussion that they've brought over to Anand for closing remarks. Thank you, Professor Sarsu. So if I may just provide the vote of thanks. Uh, my first uh, 
uh, thanks should be to the co-organizers at NLS, who include uh, Hakanksha, Vineshri, Anushya, and the, and the staff there. Uh, of course, immensely to the panelists and to the moderator. Uh, also to Mr. Jairam, who's, uh, who had started the whole idea, to our admin staff here at NIAS, including Ramesh, who is always here. And of course, finally, to the audience, both from within and outside. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, good evening.